Hey, uh, you know, Simon, I think, recognised my emotion. I've got it a bit now. I could, you know, I spent so much time over the weekend, um, you know, sort of thinking this through. Would I be able to get on the plane? Would I not be able to get on the plane? Because it's been so long since I've been over to WA. Uh, but of course, with the advent of uh, video conferencing, it hasn't meant that we've been too far away. And in many respects, of course, it means that we have come closer together. And so what I wanted to talk about today is and give heaps of time for you guys to ask questions. Um, you know, the sort of digital elephant in the room is, of course, that our cyber has merged, the scary thing of, of changing what we're doing. Um, I want to be able to talk a little bit about that if you're interested, so get your questions ready. But I wanted to focus my remarks today on exactly where we are up to as a nation when it comes to the very, very important job of growing an industry that absolutely is providing all of the solutions that underpins the trust in our economy in this crazy new world that we're facing. And so when we look at it, pre-COVID, many of you have heard me speak publicly many, many times. Uh, we were talking lots about the fact that Australia really could go global with our cybersecurity capability. Now, if you look sideways, if you're in the room physically today, you are bound to be looking at at least one of the dozens and dozens of Australian-born cybersecurity companies that we now have as industry brand names, which I'm so proud of, uh, which is fantastic. We were promoting that like there was no tomorrow back in uh, 2019 and 20, early 2020 before we went down uh, with all of the video-ness uh, of our world. Uh, but, you know, I think that what's really important to note here that while everything has changed, everything hasn't as well. Uh, we still are growing amazing Australian cybersecurity companies in Western Australia as well as nationally. In fact, colleagues, during the bulk of 2020, of course, when most of us, by the time we got to this time last year, were wondering whether or not, uh, you know, half of the SMEs in the economy would get wiped out by the lockdowns and the economic uncertainty, it was almost as though all of that work that we had done from 2016 through all the way to 2020 was actually preparing our industry to have its time. We have talked more about sovereign cyber capability in the last 12 months than we ever have before, ever in this country. We have been focusing on the fact that within the portfolio that we refer to as the Oz cyber companies, those that are Australian born cybersecurity companies, we've only lost two companies to the pandemic as a result of the economic environment that we find ourselves in. Now, when we were going into the throes of lockdown and I was providing daily updates to the federal government around where things were up to for us as an industry, we were staring down the barrel at that point of all of the information pointing to the fact that we could have lost around about 40% of our companies. So what that means is that not only were we armed and ready to be able to respond to the needs of the economy with all of the ambiguity and with all of the confusion that we were going through, we were able to not only deliver those products and services that are so important, we were able to change the nature of the conversation. Now, this is something that as an industry, we've been working really, really hard at. So I genuinely do want to give yourselves a high five for this. It was so important that we were able to change the nature of the conversation. And I've actually just come off stage from being at CEDAR's State of the Nation conference in, in Canberra today and uh, did that virtually as well, uh, where we were talking with uh, Keith Ritchie um, and, uh, you know, the Minister for uh, uh, Home Affairs, Karen Andrews. See, I've even started there because Karen was our Minister for um, Industry at the federal level for a long time there. And so in that conversation, what we we're focusing on is how the needle has shifted, not just in terms of us becoming more aware of cyber risk, but how cyber risk has upsides as well as downsides. We see lots more reporting in the media now about the downsides of cyber risk, but actually we are very well poised and need to lean in more to the conversation around how cyber resilience and digital trust opens up volumes of opportunity. Today, but most importantly, over the coming 12 months as the world really does figure out the moving parts of how we try and get the mobility of people happening again. Now, of course, I say that knowing full well the trials and tribulations even of Cyber West as an amazing event in bringing us all together, 
in having some of us not being able to move across the country to come and visit you. This is our new reality. And of course, until we have a stabilisation around the vaccine side of things, we are faced with these circumstances for a very long time. And we can point to recent history comparative to the human existence around the polio vaccine, where it really did take decades before polio was considered to be eradicated from the planet. And we still see pockets of it appearing from time to time. That's the experience we need to be looking at. But what's changed, of course, is the fact that we have now got a digital dimension to this. And I'm not gonna go through all of those facets because of course, this is a room that is very, very well versed in it. But that change in the conversation, can I tell you from all of the sort of behind closed doors conversations that I've been involved in, as well as the ones that are very, very public, what has actually changed is the sophistication of how we see convergence. Now this event, and congratulations to everyone that's been a part of it, including you, the audience. This event is absolutely a representation of that convergence. We've got three hubs, as the chief scientist uh, eloquently described. Uh, we've got those three hubs pointing to the fact that collaboration is how we really do step up and not just manage those cyber risks as part of our normal business. We know that it's a set of business risks, not IT risks, but also use them use that management as a form of new growth. And this is where we're seeing so much opportunity. That convergence piece can create so much complexity and so much fear, particularly for small businesses, but also for large businesses as well, as well as government agencies. That convergence though opens up so many opportunities. So I'm going to pause by saying that if you haven't got your questions ready, get them, get them, get them going. Uh, digital trust. And I'm going to also add to digital trust by saying tech for good. These are phrases that we can all be using to actually literally change the way that people in a moment of time think about cyber risk. Now, the digital world, as we know it to be, is cyber physical. We know that. But we still have so many colleagues in the business and government world who actually don't live and breathe that every day from a conscious point of view. Of course, they are actors in it just as much as we are. But we do still need to up the ante on making sure that we remember that not everyone has a deep understanding of these issues in the way that we have. But gosh, they are curious. So all of that industry development that we've had I implore all of us to continue to remember that we are just at the beginning. And I will remind us that, of course, within WA, it's very, very easy to talk about uh, mining and agriculture. Some of you have heard me say this before, but I do think that it's worthwhile reminding ourselves. Agriculture is the oldest sector of our economy, and it has received government support from the moment it became a formal sector when the signing of the constitution happened in 1901. Every single year since then, governments around the country have supported the agriculture industry from a financial as well as policy perspective. This is the critical role that government has to play in new industries and critically for cybersecurity because we enable all other industries. We are seeing that in spades in WA, and we love our relationship with the WA government, but we do also enjoy that relationship with every other government around the country, including, of course, the national government that is the Australian government. The public-private partnership has never been more important, and everyone has a part to play in that. But let's get that conversation happening around tech for good and digital trust. Tanya, I'll open for questions there if, if we've got some. It's silence at my end, so I'm not sure what's happening there. <laughs> I can keep talking, of course. Everyone knows I can talk under wet concrete. Michelle, we just, uh, we're just uh, getting some people with questions in the room. If you can just introduce yourself by uh, maybe name and if you want to mention a quick company in there, and uh, please, we'd love to have some questions. Don't leave Michelle hanging. <laughs> I'll fill the void, people. I will fill the void. Sorry, Michelle. Um, can you hear me now? I can. Fantastic. So we're going to open the floor now to questions. 
We'll have our two volunteers roaming each end of the room. Just put your hand up if you like to ask Michelle a question. Hand over to you guys. Don't be scared of the microphone. <laughs> Well, maybe what I do here is um, jump in and sort of suggest that data is so important to be able to prove the value of our industry, as well as, of course, each individual organisation. We have got a lot of data already available. Uh, for those of you that aren't aware, jump onto the Offcyber website. You'll see the sector competitiveness plan, but also a whole bunch of other data that's available around the types of companies that you're seeing in the room. And my team would be very cranky with me if I didn't remind everyone that we now have a digital ecosystem that matches the physical ecosystem of Australian cybersecurity companies, and that's in the form of AU Cyberscape. So if you are wondering who everyone is within the industry, jump onto auscyberscape.com.au and you'll be able to find out all about the different companies against their capability types. That's a really important uh, contribution. It's a public good. Uh, for so many different reasons, whether you're a buyer, a provider, uh, a policymaker, an investor, um, or just a curious individual to try and figure out what all of this stuff is all about. Michelle, we do have one question here. Hey. Oh, I'll just hand over. Hi, Michelle. Does, uh, I'm, I've just come out of high school and I was wondering, does Offcyber run any programs for, say, school-age kids? Because I feel like a lot of people my age wouldn't know basic cybersecurity practices like password managers and things like that. Oh, thank you so Sorry, much, Michelle. Question. If I can give you context, since I know you can't see the room, uh, people my age, it was a younger gentleman asking the question, possibly. <laughs> possibly. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Thank you. And thank you so much for your question. And thanks for being curious. Uh, absolutely, Ostcyber has funded so many programs around the country uh, to be able to make sure that uh, school students of any age, whether we're older, <laughs> or younger, right down to the ages of five years old, a whole series of programs that have been rolled out across the country and are still being rolled out across the country. But if you're super keen to find out the details, jump on again to our website. We've got a dashboard, an education dashboard that talks about where those courses are occurring. If you're still within primary school and high school, uh, you won't see that on the website, but there is an Australian Cyber Schools competition that we have funded in conjunction with Australia's top four banks combined with BT. Uh, and so your colleagues in the room from CBA and others will be able to show you to that. Uh, that's actually a set of competency-based um, learning that gets offered within the classroom and it culminates within a set of competitions each year. We also have funded Cyber Taipan and if you're in high school right now, Cyber Taipan has kicked off again for its annual uh, competition. That's actually where you get to apply the skills that you learn from the competency-based learning that happens in the classroom and win amazing prizes. If you're an adult and you're keen to get involved in those kinds of competitions, there is a dashboard that shows you where the latest competitions are and there's a whole series of ones including one that I'll call out that's being run at the moment by Fifth Domain uh, who I think is in the house so to speak uh, that's a global competition with counterparts across Five Eyes and beyond uh, so there's a huge range of opportunities there from an education point of view but if you're also looking for a job in cyber security well you could talk to anyone in the room right now because of course everyone is hiring but you can also go to a platform called cyberseek.com.au and that is a platform that shows you where the jobs are, um, specifically by geography. This is something else that we funded to happen so that we've got the visualisation around where the jobs are happening and who is providing those jobs. So a whole bunch of tools that we've provided for the country to be able to start tackling the skills shortages problem. And who wouldn't want to be in cybersecurity? It is so exciting. Thanks, Michelle. I think we've got time for one more question anywhere in the room. Right hand side is lagging, lagging a little bit here. Thank you very <laughs> Hi, much. Hi, Michelle. I there was Alice there, here. Over there. Hope you're well. Sorry, you couldn't be here today. Uh, question Tell us more about, not a question actually, tell us your thoughts and how you communicate digital trust uh, mm -hmm. to different stakeholders. If, if that's a focus now, because cybersecurity can be a bit hard to engage with sometimes, so maybe digital trust is a term that we can use um, more frequently in the industry. 
Awesome, that's such a great question, thank you. Uh, so we do use as our main tool of communication the digital trust report that we published mid last year. I can't believe it was almost a year ago that we launched that report. We're about to start working on this year's update to it. But we basically use case studies to be able to show what the components of digital trust are. And that work, by the way, just so we can get a little bit patriotic for a moment, is the foundation of some work that I'm involved in at the World Economic Forum that's going to go completely global around the conception of digital trust. So the kinds of elements that go into that, of course, are many of what we see in the physical domain when we talk about what these circles of trust are and how trust is earned. Uh, and how you can actually have sort of layers of trust. And of course, we know what those things are when it comes to working in a workplace, but also in our personal relationships as well. And so in the digital world, what's different? And these are the key things that we talk about in the report. Of course, there's no borders, either physically or actually digitally around these things, apart from what the technology prevents us from being able to do. And this is where the patching and also all of the ransomware stuff can kind of explode in the conversation right there. But in terms of the infrastructures involved, we talk a lot about how the infrastructures are quite different, quite different because they interact from an online perspective, as well as, of course, in the physical world. And you've got loads of companies in the room that work in this every day. And, and of course, Sapien is the flagship for that in WA, uh, but all of, all of the others are as well. And so... There's that piece. We also know that um, what you've heard many, many times over is the pace at which things can occur in the online world and the impacts that that has in the kinetic space, the physical space. And so talking to people about how we need to focus on this as an investment, because if we're not responding uh, as well as being proactive to the types of risks that manifest within the digital domain, then that's when we start to see trust eroded. And that's again where we circle back to trust. And you can start to see that actually assurance, not compliance, is what is so important within the cyber domain. And that's what I spend a lot of time talking about too. So when I'm talking to boards, for example, or talking to policymakers, the conversation tends to start with why assurance is so important. And yes, we need to have elements of um, compliance, but assurance is where we need to focus our energies because assurance is what gives us the flexibility to work through what is actually highly contextual in cyber. And so this is kind of the key takeaway that a lot of businesses that don't work in the cyber sort of security realm every day actually really latch on to. The reason why it's such a challenge for us, all of us around the world, is that every single instance of a digital experience is so highly contextual. So how do you then go about managing that in a way that people walk away from that instance still retaining trust and assurance around the infrastructures and the data and the way that that works with all of the digital things, uh, sorry, the physical things, how do we do that? Well, we need to make sure that we're constantly flexing and we're constantly looking to the horizon around what might happen next. And so there's so much complexity in that, but it really opens up a much more constructive and pragmatic conversation by starting from those positions as opposed to talking about the latest threat that's been deployed around the world that's causing the sky to fall uh, around cryptocurrencies having to be paid for a ransomware attack. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, Michelle. It's uh, Bex Nighthurt here from Paraflare. Um, thank you for talking today and thank you also for talking at ComfyCon, um, which is where I guess my uh, question leads um, from because you spoke about the significant growth in the cybersecurity industry and it's really, you know, fantastic that throughout, you know, this period of well, yeah, uncertainty and a lot of grief um, that we've only lost two um, companies from, uh, you know, all of those that have that have grown throughout the years. Um, I guess my first point is, could you please go back to the numbers if you've got them at hand at, you know, how many um, companies we have right now and um, the increase that we've, uh, we've you know, seen um, and also, Sorry to put you on the spot, but do you have a, you know, your 
favourite example of how um, you know some cybersecurity companies have adapted and you know remained resilient throughout this period. Oh, thanks, Vic, and thanks for referring to ComfyCon. That was one of my most favourite speaking engagements that I had last year. It really, truly was. Uh, so, audience, if you don't know what ComfyCon is, make sure you go and speak to Beck and get involved. It's such a cool con. Uh, so, I guess to answer the first question, uh, if we remind everyone that when OSCyber first started, uh, which was uh, you know back in 2017 on the 1st of January, I can't believe how old we are now. It feels like four decades, not four years um, in many ways. Uh, but back then we estimated, because there was no data, we estimated that there were around about 60 companies operating in Australia that were discrete cybersecurity companies. Now, not all of those were Australian born cybersecurity companies. Um, in fact, quite a few of them were multinationals and they're all the brands that we all know. Uh, today, we know that there is well over 550 companies operating discreetly within cybersecurity. And our estimation is that there are now thousands of organisations that are working in the cybersecurity sort of domain more broadly. So these are organisations largely uh, that we now know as, um, you know, that the broader uh, economy knows as MSPs, managed service providers that have turned themselves into managed security service providers. Uh, so thousands of organisations that have a cyber component a cyber unit, um, a cyber business line within their organisation that is focused on cyber security. Uh, in terms of how many of those are Australian born, we're actually, we've seen the tipping of the balance, friends, we've seen it happen. The overwhelming majority of the companies now operating in cyber security as a discrete uh, vertical, uh, we now see 68% of them being Australian born. Hallelujah, isn't that amazing? That is so cool. I'm so proud of that and all of us should be too. Now, that's not to say that we don't like our multinational friends. Of course we do. But what it shows is that we now have our own cyber resilience within our industry. But competition is a good thing because there wasn't competition before. There is now choice and that choice is trusted. Uh, so in terms of my favourite ones that have sort of pivoted and responded and really made um, themselves, I guess, useful during this COVID period, that's such a tough choice. Um, there are actually so many. And that's what's amazing. Again, that makes me very, feel very humble in terms of how many of our companies have been able to respond in earnest to the ambiguity and the uncertainty of the last 18 months. Um, it would be remiss of me not to focus on a WA company though, wouldn't it? I'm sort of feeling like the room is smiling right now. So let me do that so that, you know, at the risk of all of the online people who are dialing into this, you're gonna get a little bit annoyed with me, but I'll focus on WA. Look, um, I think that I'd, I'd have to go with, and there's like a bit of a drum roll here, uh, I'd have to go with Red Piranha. And, you know, this is because Red Piranha had some very, very cool tech uh, behind them before we went down into lockdown. Uh, but the way in which the use cases have spun out of the set of tech now that, um, that Red Piranha has, it's not just one platform anymore, and being able to demonstrate very, very, rapidly as well as in clear business terms what it means for the customer in clear business terms what those use cases are and have absolutely seen uh, some fantastic growth as a response now i do feel sad that i you know could name everyone all of the companies within wa have done an amazing job of their growth um, spikes in terms of that adaptation though i think the crown's got to go to red piranha well done adam and team thank you michelle Thank you so much for that, Michelle. Unfortunately, that's all that we have time for. But uh, please uh, flood Michelle's email with uh, inbox with emails if you have any other questions. I'm sure she'd love that. Sorry, Michelle. <laughs> Team, this brings us to.